call the meeting uh, to order. And the first uh, item on the agenda is a roll call. And I will start in alphabetical order. Please, I'll say your name and please, if you're here, indicate by saying here. George Baumgarten. Here. Susan Bryan. I don't know. I can't get any audio on this. What was that? Susan Bryant, are you here? Nope. Okay. Uh, Eric Cruz? Nope. Timothy Davis is here. Lisa Hewitt Dick? Here. You might have been used already. Lori Gibbons? We need to sign off. Yeah. What? Lori? It seems that somebody who isn't a member is not muted and they're talking. Okay, if you're, okay, please mute your phone if you're not, or mute your, uh, yourself if you're not participating. Lori Gibbons, are you here? Jeff Hartwell. Sean Keneally. Hmm. Mike Sardina. Here. Uh, and Barbara Canny. Barbara Canny, I know, is here. I can see Barbara Canny here. Yes. Uh, it's a one, two, three, four, five. We need one more person to be have a quorum. Let me try to start texting people, um, Tim. What's that? I'll see if I can get Susan or Lori. Maybe yeah. they're away. Okay, that would be helpful. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Say la vie. I think Lori might be coming in now. Okay. Well, if she is, that makes a quorum. Lori, are you here? Can you hear me? Ah, there you are. Lori, are you here? Yes, I am. Oh, thank you. Okay. We now have a quorum. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is the uh, May 10th meeting of the Cohasset Harbor Committee. Uh, we have a, a full agenda here. Uh, we're going to try to uh, move it right along, but certainly if, if uh, you have questions, uh, comments, whatever, if you can indicate that, uh, uh, Cassandra is going to be monitoring this, and uh, so just indicate by clicking on your raised hand or whatever you do, and she will then let me know, uh, and we will uh, we will admit you. Um, so with that, I think there are no minutes to approve today. Uh, so we'll that, go. That, that's correct, of... Tim. No minutes today. No minutes today, George. Okay. Uh, we do have recordings of all of our meetings. So if anyone is interested, they can uh, find those recordings on the website. So with that, we'll get into the, the business of the, of the meeting. Uh, Eamon O'Mara, who is representing uh, the Cohasset Wharf uh, projects for both Atlantica and the Mill River site uh, is going to make a, uh, a brief presentation after which we'll take uh, questions and answers. So with that, Eamon, welcome. Uh, I see that uh, Tom Sullivan had signed in as well. Welcome, Tom. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, if we can share the screen, you can go right ahead. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Tim, very much. And Susan Holdley is here. She's going to be doing the screen sharing to uh, bring up uh, a presentation we have that gives you the overview of the project. Um, but again, thank you for having us. We're very excited to meet with you all tonight to present to you where we are with the project on both the properties. Uh, specifically, 846 border has is, is been filed in us much more detail. Um, Tom Sullivan, I think he said dialed in, but he was on the road earlier when I spoke with him. We were getting ready for this. But um, again, Great to be meeting tonight. We really are excited to get your feedback. Um, 
Tim, you know, is, is a dear friend and has been helping us um, and, you know, talking about ideas. This goes back a while. I think last time I met with your committee, I was an out-of-towner uh, and it was, and I have since moved now and live on Border Street, although, although still technically out of town because I'm in situate. But uh, now I, you know, am here in this community and did team up with Tom Sullivan and it's super exciting um, to, you know, be working on this. This is such an important piece of property in, con in, in connection with obviously 82 border, which is the lobster pound property. Um, so before we give you sort of the, the presentation, just, just sort of an update on where we are with the process, we have filed permits for 46 border street, which we are, is, is now called Cohasset Wharf. Um, we've had two meetings with the ZBA, one meeting with CONCOM, one meeting with planning, and we have another round of meetings coming up with all those groups over the next month. Um, you know, we, we've come up with something that's very exciting and we'll show that to you, but at this point there's really broad support. You know, generally we're hearing great feedback from the neighborhood, a butters community in general. Um, and, you know, the, the project as you'll, as you'll see is one about taking this important property and improving it in many ways that benefit the, the, the town and the, and the residents. And um, so Susan, if, if, if you've got this slideshow ready, yep. what I'll do is just first sort of present to you. And I, I told him, I try to keep this brief um, and then happy to answer any questions and, and, you know, go back and forth as much as you'd like. But if, if you, if, if you hit the next slide, Susan, um, we're all familiar with it, with what is existing. Um, the, the building, of course, 46 border Atlantica, as shown, and then the lower buildings, which are 82 Border Street, the Lobster Pound properties, both owned by Tom Sullivan. Just as note, the old Salt House, the very small square, you know, rectangular component is not owned by Tom, that's owned by our, our, our good friends at Cohasset Hospitality Partners. But the existing property, our intent here is to, we work very hard with Holdy Martinez and Adam Brodsky is our attorney that we don't have on tonight. And Darren Grady, we don't have on tonight. Uh, we, we, uh, we thought that Susan and I could handle this and you know tag team it, present our vision. Um, uh, so it's really about, if you, if, you, if you think about where we are, about how this is really not serving the town. And there's a number of issues with this property. Um, and it's really kind of a large single purpose facility with a, you know, a parking issue that creates a swell of activity that doesn't really do much for the town at all, provides no access to the water sheet, um, kind of creates sort of a, a, a out of town or kind of overwhelming mass at the, at the location. And then, and then of course, the lobster bound properties, which are so beautiful and really need to be reimagined as well. We don't have a lot of detail on the 82 border street lobster bound property tonight, but we'll I'll talk a little bit about that. But if Susan, if you get to the next slide, we start. We can start talking about what we're really trying to do here. The current building has a seating capacity of 307 people, <laughs> as presented in their uh, marketing pieces for weddings, banquets, function facilities, and the parking lot, as laid out, which does not conform to any kind of space layouts, and in fact, many of the spaces are kind of uh, you know, on and off the property to some degree, only total 52 seats, uh, 52 parking spaces, excuse me. So currently there's this, there's this problem where you've got a large facility that's roughly 15,000 square feet with a seating capacity of 307 and only 52 parking spaces. Well, if you do a ratio on the parking at a one to three, you really need about 102 spaces at this property to meet intent with planning in the town. So they're, they're well off of that by 50% currently we, in, in the way the property operates. So we've said, you know, let's reimagine this. We have to look at this differently and look at how to make this building smaller, operate differently and, and park better and solve the parking. So the next slide starts to get into our thinking. If you look at the history of the site, the buildings were actually more of a collection of smaller structures with pathways through to the water's edge public access to the water sheet um, and more of a sustainable set of smaller uh, commercial mercantile 
uh, you know, buildings. And if you look at the, the site plan, and Susan, you can keep clicking here, um, um, what we've done is we've tried to scale these down. And so we talk a lot about reimagine, renovate, and improve. So if we reimagine the property, looking at some historical context, and think about how we can improve connections to the water sheet, how we can improve pedestrian access uh, and reduce the scale of the building. So we're going down to roughly 9,000 square feet from the sort of 15 to 14,000 square foot structure. And the big moves we're cutting essentially the central section of the roof out in the building. So you see what we're doing is we're creating this, this open to sky component, which walks straight out to the back. And in addition, and, and you'll see this further in the plans, and I, once I get through sort of the, the vision and the sort of ideas of what, what we're trying to do here and what Tom uh, Sullivan's intent is with the properties, I'm gonna allow Susan to talk about the architecture as well and she can get into that detail. Um, if we look at that reimagining it and then the renovating it, it really is a renovation. It's not a substantial improvement. We're really taking what we have, sort of carefully carving it apart, windows, skin, uh, features, and then the improvements are the access to the water sheet to the back with the covered wharf. Currently, there's no access to that float. Um, facilities of public accommodation, you'll see that in the plans. Um, and a, 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 you know, a walking situation, which doesn't exist now, what we're really showing is the parking is pulled back at the seawall so you can walk along the edge there. And, and, the, and then the current border street sidewalk really doesn't operate now because parking kind of goes on and over that. So if you look at this diagram, and then if you think about, you know, as you can see in relation to 80 to Border Street, our, our proposal, which we're going to be finishing up our plans on that, filing that shortly, uh, is for a small inn there. You start to think about how this is transformed from a big clunky function hall, which has a huge parking problem, to a smaller set of sustainable businesses that improves access to the edge for public access and then actually has solves the parking problem. Um, and on 82 border, we're gonna we're gonna look to solve the parking internally there with that end. It starts to change the whole dynamic of the people being able to walk to the edges and get to the water and really enjoy the harbor uh, and the edge. So if you go to the next slide, we start to get into some of those details. Our new building, and you'll see further in the plans, has a current seat count of 96 and that's down from 307. So at a one to three, we really need 32 to 34 parking spaces. The current parking lot is laid out in, again, in not a, not a code format or any kind of circulation format. So we've actually reduced the parking to 34 parking spaces, but it actually conforms to the required parking at 96 seats. So if you go to the next slide, Susan, we, this is what I was referring to as the 34 spaces. And then one more slide, Susan. Here is the, here is the layout of the parking lot. Um, the inside, and, and Grady Engineer has laid this out, inside the property, conforming to code, conforming to space layouts, handicap requirements, circulation. We actually have now landscaping. We have you know, a proper layout and the parking that conforms to a reduced seat count and a reduced square footage in a building that again, allows for all those improvements that we've been trying to achieve so people can penetrate the building and get to the water's edge, uh, have public bathrooms. So the overall project was all about, again, reimagining a simple, you know, a, you know, a really fantastic renovation. You'll see the architecture and the improvements to the town. So in the next slide, we, we show kind of, again, revisit where we are. We've got this one large structure, the behemoth that is the Atlantica blob with one point of entry. And if you go to the diagram, the next page that Holy Martinez has developed with us in conjunction with our, our team and, and Tom's vision and our intent with the property, you start to see a whole different diagram you see multiple points of entry to multiple smaller venues to a seam that runs through as sort of, again, a harbor walk 
Um, and importantly, the back piece we call the covered wharf, which is currently that sort of sunken dining hall, which has sort of the commercial sheet glass pane windows, is now an open wharf. And we are intent to keep that fully open, like a front porch, like you see almost at the Yacht Club, that sort of porch area. Um, and then you can actually walk through the building to the edge. And what we're doing is we're basically reducing the restaurant to a viable size facility that can be leased. We reduce the, the piece to the right we call the coffee shop to a viable size piece that can re be reduced and, and be sustainable. We actually have leases in the works for both of those spaces that are you know, local and fantastic operations. And then the gray area and the forward area are the existing bathrooms, which we're going to maintain and, and you know you know you know touch up. But that allows us the facilities of public accommodation. So if you think about the intent with the property and how important it is for the town, we're solving all these things, and that's that's the intent. Um, and we've spent a lot of time on this. We feel very good about our situation and the enthusiasm at the planning board. Uh, we've focused very heavily on parking and really a lot of this comes down to parking. And we think with that seat count, you know, we obviously have solved it. The required 32 to 34 and we have 34. So beyond that, it's gonna be beautiful. We're gonna create pathways, the captain's walk concept it's a little complicated, but the idea is that we're pulling those parking spaces back from the seawall, creating new ways to walk, safer pathways, better landscaping, and again, improvements to the connection to the water sheet and a, you know, a better overall sustainable long-term solution for the town of Cohasset. Um, you know, Tom's committed to doing it. We, we need to you know, get, get this through and, and get going. Uh, we've been very strategic about the effort, Tim. Um, I'd, I'd kind of like to, now hand off to Susan um, of Holding Martinez, who I'm sure many of you know in town and they're just such fantastic architects and are so talented and creative. Obviously, you'll toot their horn, you know, the sailing club and many other projects in town, but they've done some wonderful work. And I think I'll stop there and let Susan talk a little bit up with the architects and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Eamon. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Eamon, for that, um, for setting the table for us. Again, um, I am Susan Hoadley. I'm here to uh, tell you about uh, the architecture of our renovation, our reimagining, and our improvement of the site. The main architectural idea here, as Eamon said, is that we're taking this um, very large behemoth of a complex that has been knitted together over time and we're pulling it apart. And this is, this is very much a project that isn't about imposing a brand new vision exclusively, but rather working very, very sensibly with what we have as existing conditions. And the central idea here really goes back to those diagrams that Eamon just showed that you also see in this diagram, which is the planning diagram for the first floor of the project. And that is that each one of these orange spaces is really um, a throughway, a circulation, a, a way to just open this complex up into something that is based on great community wharves throughout New England. You know, we looked at Nantuck we looked at things on Nantucket, we've looked at things on Marblehead, Provincetown, all of the all of the, the wharves that without being big outdoor spaces are very, very highly functioning, flexible uh, spaces that are really, really enjoyed by the community and allow people to get to the water sheet and to come out and, um, and also bring business to the town. So this, this plan here shows, uh, in the, the purple areas show fine dining, which are uh, a 70 seat restaurant and a coffee shop in purple uh, down where we're showing uh, in, the, in the right here. And then uh, the middle part that says fine outdoor dining would actually be used by both fine dining and the coffee shop. This fits into a larger solution to the problem where we are using a, uh, a a staggered clock model to show that different, different um, 
one of the different different of these small businesses are open to open at different times throughout the day so that even so that the parking can be shared um, on a shift basis by these different businesses. The lobster pound, as you uh, see down near the entry, um, is uh, doesn't have any seating, but it creates kind of the um, the, the front door of the wharf, uh, which we thought was appropriate given the um, the the you know the absolutely essential uh, function that the uh, lobster industry plays in the town. And then the, there's an ice cream shop further down this open walkway that brings people down into the wharf and hopefully allows them to take their ice cream into uh, the front porch as Eamon described it and down onto any boat dockage um, that's available as you see up in the, uh, the Northeast part of the plan. So um, another, another very exciting piece of it is uh, as Eamon said, the uh, the bathrooms that are available um, to the public, and they they literally are on the new captain's walk as it's being developed or conceptualized. And in this too, we have incorporated various um, various places for the inclusion of things like uh, the captain's walk program, which could happen. Uh, speaking to with Jackie Dormitzer, uh, probably there a great place would be in front of the coffee shop for that, or along the Captain's Walk, where you could learn about the former incarnation of this site as Tower Wharf. This is a roof plan. We don't need to go into that too much. But here are the elevations and the sections. And these are, uh, this is a combination of uh, facades that are, that you would see uh, from the exterior and slices through the building that show what you would see as you go in. So on each one of these that I'm about to present, the before condition is shown above, and then identically below it is the proposal, the after shot. And this uh, south elevation, which is what you would see from the parking lot, will just go from left to right. As you can see, the salt house stays intact, as does the, um, the, the, the uh, baffle that has been created for loading next to it. Those things sort of stay as is. And right where the mouse is now begins our project. We have a uh, delivery area for the wholesale lobster business here. And then you move over to the pickup area for the lobster business uh, here with a very traditional uh, porch wrap around, which then wraps around and becomes the area for the walkthrough that goes out to the water in this area. So where I am showing the mouse here, that is actually open air where you can walk all the way to the end to the uh, the, the flagship restaurant to the fine dining. Now, uh, we have elected to add um, a partner to that, um, to that cupola in the front. Uh, this will be detailed in greater, with greater care once uh, the approvals are gotten for the general height, scale, and mass of the building. But for now, we believe that this, uh, the height of this is actually, um, some will be somewhat inobtrusive and counterbalance the opening nicely and si signal the way into the whole complex. Mm -hmm. This, this uh, bay element right to the right is, uh, it, it's a holdover from the Hugo's Lighthouse element, which has since uh, gone away, but we, uh, we also realize that there's many things about this complex that are near and dear to folks and uh, saved things as we could. As you do moving along to the right, you have the bathrooms and a uh, in this area, as you know where they are now, and then over to the right, the entry to the coffee shop. And with that, I'll go right down to the east elevation. This is the elevation that you would see 
uh, as you were coming down Border Street toward the uh, complex. Oh no, no, this is this is from the water. Excuse me. This is the uh, this is the exterior from uh, the actual water sheet. And what we're proposing, as Eamon mentioned, is to take out the sort of somewhat relentless, hermetically sealed fixed plate glass windows, replace them with windows that can open to harness the sea breezes and uh, just make for better a better environment inside. Open up that open up that uh, that closed area now into something where people can eat outside, and then to the right, simply replacing windows to become operable and uh, get greater um, thermal efficiency in the winter. I would to jump in, I, I, maybe it sort of speaks for itself because Holy Martinez does such beautiful architectural work, but it's a very careful move of taking what we have and adding and subtracting. So subtract, subtracting spaces to reduce the size of the building, but then adding character. You know, so for instance, the coffee shop to the right, that's all existing. All we're doing is adding a peak roof at the door. And it changes yeah. the whole situation there of how that presents itself for a, a resident who is going to approach that side of the building. And you can see it in real life. So and I think the renderings really speak to that, sort of the before and after. Um, there's, there's such great detail in the filigree of the work that will be done, which will be first class, of course. And, you know, speaking for Tom, Tom always says, everything's real materials, no plastics. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tom is very intent on, mm -hmm. you know, uh, perfection, but we are trying to be very careful to really just do a very careful renovation. And that's kind of what you're seeing is these, these moves like window changes and opening up the back. Um, it, it will change the entire character of the property. Can I make a couple of comments here? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, let me say I'm, I'm uh, really excited. I'm delighted and thank you, Eamon. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Tom, wherever you may be. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, is going to be a, a huge uh, improvement to the Harbor community without any question. Uh, there are a couple of issues that I know that you are dealing with uh, and you have the right team. Uh, I can just uh, mention anecdotally, whenever I go into the sailing club building, I see uh, architectural nuances I hadn't noticed before that are, I really appreciate. It's, a, it's an iconic building and, it, and it's great. Uh, the, uh, the first one is of course parking and it's not just the parking for, uh, for this, uh, facility, but it's the the whole uh, harbor community parking all the way along uh, Border Street, and uh, and it's something that we as a, a community have to have to address and have to deal with. You, of course, uh, have to comply with zoning regulations, uh, but you also have the the salt house next door that requires parking that. Uh, really doesn't have much parking. So somehow we as a community have to deal with the parking. And I can tell you there is a, a small group of, of uh, citizens that are looking at parking both in the harbor area and uh, the village that are uh, uh, working uh, to try to make suggestions and proposals for how to improve uh, parking. The other thing is on parking, while you may have uh, the appropriate number of parking places for uh, seats in the in the fine dining restaurant. You also have employees, and I don't know how many employees will be there from one time or another, but my guess is it's fairly substantial. So somehow you have to deal with uh, people that are parking for eight hours, ten hours uh, at a time. Uh, and you don't want them taking places for uh, people that are there to either go to the coffee shop or uh, the lobster pound to pick up some lobsters or the or the dining. So anyway, that's just uh, kind of a rhetorical yep. uh, comment. Okay. The, uh, the other thing too, that the previous owner uh, was uh, somewhat uh, uh, immune to is the 
a noise that came from not only this facility, but the old uh, uh, Coasset Harbor Inn facility when there were functions there. And that has got, as you, I'm sure you know, the neighbors on edge. Uh, and when you talk about uh, opening windows and having outdoor dining, uh, that is a concern uh, to the community. And it's just something that needs to be addressed. Uh, somehow, uh, I'm sure you have heard this before, but you need to be attuned to uh, the concerns of the neighbors who, by the way, are, I think, generally very supportive of doing this. Uh, they're tired of looking at dark spaces for years and years and years, and they're very supportive of it. Uh, but we just have to make sure that we address those are just two and I'll, I'll leave it at that. No, but, thank you, Tim. Understood. Yeah, no, I mean, we could, we could address those. I don't need to necessarily answer all of that right now for you. No, I, I can't no I don't those. expect no, you I, to. I got that. I, I very much appreciate that and understood. No. Okay. Uh, do you have any comments on what's going on with the Mill River property? And maybe Susan, you just finished the presentation because I think what's oh, okay. helpful is as we we have sort of this, you know, the big picture, yeah, reimagine, renovate, improve concepts, and then we have you can see it. It's and then of course the elevations are beautiful, but the renderings which are on the next pages show really the the condition changes. The uh, the Mill River Wharf we call eighty two Border Street, um, and you know, of course, here is existing structure, and then you conflict to you know what we're proposing, and then there's another angle that presents it. It just helps to sort of frame the whole concept. Yep. The River Wharf, we're intending to um, relocate the lobster pound, and I'm glad that Susan mentioned that earlier. Uh, the 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 lobster pound use and and how that operates is exactly not clear yet. However, the Cohasset lobster pound. We will, we we're going to have that located in the in this uh, a, a, in 46 border here. We're going to move that away from that location. Um, the building that they're in now, which was the boat building, is actually is a pretty big issue. It it, it floods out um, all the time. I mean, you know, not even any kind of major storm. It'll it'll flood out. Um, you know, two feet in there. So that building's got to come down. Uh, the other structures are beautiful and sturdy and relatively new. They're basically shell, they're shell and core. Uh, we think those need to be raised up. We think the, the building that comes down, which is the, the boat building, will do a new building in that location. And then we have an, a whole set of setbacks, um, chapter 91, conformance, there was a license issued prior from the previous owner for a, a pier that projected straight off of the uh, boat building. We're gonna uh, resubmit that and, and get that, that license back to put that pier out there. We're gonna have, the boat building is actually in the velocity zone. So that structure will be elevated up with no uses on the ground floor, but it'll be uh, conforming to velocity. And then the rest of the spaces are going to be converted into an inn uh, with potentially a water dependent use over the flowed timeline component where there's the open uh, water flow under the middle building. Um, and, you know, currently the program is roughly around 15 rooms. And in some ways, it's a little bit like uh, parking drives the program. So we, we have a current layout with with Grady Engineering and with Holy Martinez of 15 parking spaces that truly park on the site. And that does the one for one parking for the inn. Um, and then you know, there'd be some associated program with the inn of, um, you know, like you'd imagine a little bed and breakfast, it might have a little kitchenette or there might be some kind of sitting area um, that would be, you know, at the hotel, the little inn. And that is the concept we're drawing it now. We didn't want to file both projects at the same time because it's just so much to talk about and present. Eight, 82 border will be a full engagement with, with MEPA uh, and the chapter 91 license process. Whereas the renovation project at uh, 46 border does not, is not a substantial improvement, does not trigger that whole situation. And therefore we can preserve those structures. 
So this is a different task. We're going to we're about to we're about to ramp that up right away, and we'll come back with that more detail on that, Tim. It's going to be beautiful, of course. Um, I'm sure it will. I'm it'll, sure it will. Thank you. Fantastic. Great. Thank you, Eamon. And, and and thank you, Susan. That uh, this is terrific. Is uh, does anybody have any questions, uh, Cassandra? Do you see any? Uh, I just have a quick question, um, uh, and, and I want to thank Susan and, and Eamon for coming and presenting in front of us, Lisa Hewitt. Um, I, I'm, Eamon, I'm, I'm glad you addressed the chapter 91 water dependent use issue, because when I saw her, I thought, hmm, <laughs> how are they going to get around this? So I'll, I'll be following that uh, closely about um, how you're going to address that. Um, it, it looks fabulous. I'm not surprised have, knowing Susan's work. Um, yeah. so thank you for putting all this effort in. Well, you're welcome, Lisa. I will just mention, I've actually gone through chapter 91 process uh, before and I'm very familiar with it. You know, ho hotels are, con are, are actually are considered facilities of public accommodation, so a use. Whereas, so for instance, the, the second floor uses in some areas of the first floor uses at 82 border hotels and allowed use. Um, whereas, say for instance, for sale housing is not, you know. Okay, that's not Condos uh, so, right. right for sale for sale house, mm -hmm. but the hotel is an allowed use in, in in within the upper floor areas. We're going to look closely at whether that that middle of those three buildings and that flowed tile that goes under that middle building is actually a made man flowed tile. It's like a dammed up situation where there's some determination as to whether it's actually a, actually naturally occurring, and that would only affect the ground floor use. Um, but the fact that it's a an inn, I mean. I personally develop a lot of hotels and the idea of the inn or the a hotel is they're, they're public spaces. I mean, in other words, you can rent the room, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they're not, it's not a public, it's not a private domain. It's a public space. And that's, what's so exciting about that is that, you know, you could rent that space. You could have family coming from out of town and have a room and you could go and enjoy that space. And so it's not, it's not any one particular own space. It's a public space in that sense. But just finally on that, when you look at the total program, having some accommodation facilities, having these smaller venues, having a coffee shop, having a viable restaurant that's the right size, you know, having parking solved and, and, and we, we solve it with the seat count. There's still some issue related to code and what the code looks at, but the zoning board has asked us to really look at seat count. But if you look at the total program, Lisa and Tim and, and the rest of us here, the intent is to make this vibrant, durable, sustainable, scaled properly, um, and more accessible for everybody. That's great, and and thank you, Eamon. Uh, and I don't want to cut this short, but I know we do have uh, yeah. a lots on the agenda here. Uh, any uh, any other final comments before we move on? Yeah, Tim, I'm it's Susan Bryan. I've just joined. I'm sorry. Um, I've been on a very hectic day. Um, I'd love to be filled in on what we're looking at and. Okay. Well, it's it's oh. all it's all being recorded, Susan. So you can certainly uh, see it. And if you have any questions, you can call me directly. I'm happy to happy to fill you in. Okay, because I also feel like there's so much going on in the harbor, and I feel like as a harbor committee member, I should know what it is, and yeah. I do yeah. not. So I'm feeling I'm feeling um, neglectful of my duties as a harbor committee when I don't know all the things that are happening, and I don't know why all the fences are up yeah. and that kind of stuff. I understand. Call anytime. I'm happy to fill you in. I, I'd also no, it's but uh, yours. No, no, Tim, Tim, Tim. We made a deal that you were going to update us regularly on all the things. Not we had to call you, but you as the chair were going to no, update the whole committee. That, that's right, and that's why we have this meeting, Susan. So thank you for joining us. That's that, that's the only way I can update the whole committee is at a uh, at a at a, a quorum uh, meeting. So that's what we're doing. Uh, okay. Any other uh, comments? Okay, thank you, Eamon, thank you, Susan, and thank you, Tom, wherever you may be. Uh, Very welcome, we, thank you, Tim, and thank you, committee. I'm gonna change the agenda just a little bit because uh, Michelle Leary has to get to the uh, select board meeting, and I've asked Michelle to give us a brief update on the uh, uh, Government Island projects and the uh, Parker Avenue boat ramp projects. So Michelle, if you can, sure. there you are. Hello, Michelle. Hi. Um, so Laurie's also on the phone in, in case we have any additional questions, um, but I'm gonna start with the Parker Ave boat ramp project. Um, we did re-sign a contract to commence work November 1st on that um, with a completion date of February 28th. 
Um, so that contract has been signed. The seaport economic funding that was awarded to the town is gonna to be rolled over to the next year. Um, so that project can be paid for. Um, the Government Island Pier project. So the timeline is this June is to start the submittal process with the state. Um, I think Lori has gone back and forth um, on the plans with, with folk and um, the fishermen. And I think we finally have a, a pretty solid plan. Um, so this June, we're gonna start the submittal process. June of 2023, we have to go before the Seaport Economic Council again for funding for Government Island. If you remember, they did fund the engineering portion, but they have not funded the construction portion because we didn't have a submittal in place. So January, 2024 is when they would start construction of the Government Island Pier. Um, and it's about a four to six month process, which would bring you into your, your May timeframe. Um, based on everything I'm hearing because of the right whales, you're not gonna be allowed to do anything until I believe it's May 30th of 2024. So that's kind of a nice timeline for Government Island. Um, a quick update on the conveyor system at Lawrence Wharf. So as you know, the prices of steel have skyrocketed. Um, our new quote for the conveyor system has increased substantially. Um, it's a 10 week lead time. Um, we are short in funding, not short enough for the project not to be a go. Um, however, I just wanna make everyone aware that we are gonna to have to ask for additional funding from the town. Um, the Lori has been in touch with Steamboat Wharf to get that um, dock built to support the conveyor system. We finally are in line. Um, to get this done. So I think 10 weeks out, we should be in a good spot. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Lori, do you have anything to add? No, I think Michelle covered everything. Um, and you know, hopefully the, the next project being uh, the next major one being the uh, boat ramp will start on time. Okay. so. Uh, so I guess we're not going to have the conveyor at Lewis Wharf this year. Is that what I'm hearing? Michelle? Uh, no, you might have it for the fall. You might have it for the fall. Okay. All right. And uh, is the conveyor that we're, uh, uh, we're imagining at this point, I use that term loosely, for Lewis Wharf uh, going to be able to uh, be moved to Government Island and used there for the conveyor that we're we're planning there. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's the intention. Okay. Uh, the conveyor good. from Lawrence Wharf will be moved over to Government Island. Excellent. Thank you, Lori. Uh, and that's uh, that's important. Uh, the uh, for those of you who haven't uh, been involved in the uh, discussion on the design of Government Island. Uh, it's a uh, uh, complete, uh, really complete renovation of what's there with an addition of uh, conveyor and lift system and additional access uh, to the docks for the commercial fishermen. Uh, the whole idea is to think about uh, uh, how to address uh, other uh, commercial aquaculture uh, technologies or industries as, uh, as we go forward. Hopefully uh, what we've got going in there over the course of the next several years uh, will be uh, something that can, uh, uh, can help any industry, any, any sea, seaward industry uh, to apply their trade. Uh, the lobstermen, I think, in general are happy with the current design. It's certainly not perfect. Uh, and I know there were alternative uh, thoughts from the commercial fishermen, uh, but what is we tried to do with uh, Carlos Pena, who is the engineer, is to come up with a design that, uh, that adequately addresses uh, all the issues. 
So uh, hopefully that's the case. And as we move forward, uh, we'll certainly keep everybody apprised of that. Any, uh, any questions at, at this point? Thank you, Michelle. And, and uh, uh, thank you, Lori, for your, for your comments. Thank you. Um, the next uh, uh, item on the agenda is uh, uh, Lisa Hewitt is gonna give us an update on the uh, Cohasset Harbor uh, uh, working group looking at governance. And uh, Lisa, if you can take a look at all the issues you're dealing with there and give us an update, I'd appreciate sure. it. Uh, happy to. Um, if everybody remembers, and many, many people probably don't, and some members of the, this committee perhaps weren't even a member of the committee when this was uh, established, um, the governance subcommittee and the CHIP subcommittee came out of a fantastic presentation put together by Laura Lind, our planning director, uh, recommending a bifurcation of the next steps for the Harvard committee work. Uh, the CHIPS was formed and members were appointed, uh, but the governance charge and appointments were only recently finalized in March of this year. Um, and members include myself, Debbie Shad, Barbara Canney, David Farag, and Lori Gibbons. And there were other sort of institutional members as needed uh, for our deliberation. Um, I'll quickly just go through what the charge is because it's, it's pretty long and it's pretty uh, involved. And, and then I'll discuss where we are now. Um, the charge uh, asks us to study merging the Government Island Advisory Committee with the Harbor Committee. That was number one. Two would be to review the charge of the current Harbor Committee and present a detailed rep recommendation for any possible changes. Three would be consider the establishment of a Municipal Waterways Commission. Four would be study the pros and cons of establishing a waterways enterprise fund and present a detailed recommendation on whether this initiative should be pursued. Five is investigate the efficacy of establishing a Massachusetts nonprofit um, public charitable entity able to qualify for charitable tax treatment and help raise funds for Harvard initiatives. Six, research and document the current public safety roles of the Harbor Master Police and fire of both Cohasset and Situate and the US Coast Guard, and seven, research, document, and make recommendations on a possible intermunicipal agreement with the town of Situate in order to ensure coordination of policies that affect the operations of the health and safety of the harbor. Since the appointments were made, we have had planning meetings with Chris Senior, our town council, our, excuse me, our town manager, and also a town council. Uh, the, the consensus arose that the first step we should take because of the present needs was the development of the intermunicipal document that is enumerated in number seven. But number six, research and document the current public safety roles of the Harbor Master Police and Fire of both Cohasset and Citrate are, is also obviously very connected. Um, we, based on the council of uh, town council, Amy Quezal, uh, we will be undertaking an assessment of the particular needs by inviting the police, fire, and harbor master over the next few meetings. We also intend on canvassing the many institutions, which fortunately the Cohasa Harbor Committee has a, most, if not all, the stakeholders as members. And so we will be reaching out to you and ask, inviting you to meetings. Um, fortunately, we have a harbor committee, as I just mentioned, to amass this information. Um, we also intend to informally speak to Situate. Uh, we were um, very happy to and surprised that a member of the Situate Harbor um, Waterways Commission attended our last uh, working group um, and invited us to attend any of their upcoming meetings. Um, so what our intent is after we finish this forensic scan, if you will, we will be meeting again with the town begin to fashion the language of an agreement. Interestingly, um, the there is no such I am you in other coastal towns. Our town council represents many, if not all of the uh, contiguous um, towns up and down the Massachusetts coast. And she did a lot of research and she found that, there, which I found amazing that no other town, contiguous towns have a similar M IMU. Um, so it'll be a first, we're excited about working on it. Uh, we intend to have several back-to-back -back meetings in the next uh, in several couple upcoming weeks. Um, and in, in addition to that, 
something that I know is a concern and an interest of, of many members is we will be reviewing the proposed draft of the shelf if bylaw that's been forwarded to us by various people and I'm in the process of clarifying with the town clerk what the process will be. But at the end of the day, as, you, as we all know, like this overall Harbor Committee, uh, this working committee, the CHIPS working committee, the governance working committee are only advisory committees that we have no uh, decision making capacity, but just uh, we are in the process of putting together solid reasoned recommendations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. And if, I don't know if anybody has any questions and Hopefully some of you will join us in uh, some of our coming uh, working groups. And Cassandra's here, so I'm glad. Yeah. Any, uh, any questions from, uh, from those of you who are here? It's Susan, again, um, I'm wondering whether if we're gonna engage in shellfish operations in Cohasset waters, whether um, we um, might think about changing the price that we're offering our shellfish warden the compensation, which is like less than 700, I think. Uh, I have no idea what relevance that has, Susan, but maybe you can enlighten me. Susan, we could perhaps possibly discuss this within the process. Yeah, of, of yeah you can do that. The, current, of the, working group. the current shellfish warden uh, uh, that we have is uh, Josh Kimball, who is uh, the national resource officer with the Cohasset police. Uh, and he's also shared with, uh, with Norwell. So he, ha he wears a number of different hats, but I can assure you he is uh, uh, very excited about being the Cohasset shellfish constable, if you will. Uh, and he is the one that uh, actually drafted a, uh, uh, a draft bylaw for uh, shellfish that uh, Lisa is reviewing. And uh, that needs to be uh, needs to be approved at a uh, special town meeting, hopefully in the fall. Uh, once we have that, uh, then uh, we have the potential, and by the way, there's testing going on of the waters all the time. Uh, and Josh Kimball as shellfish warden or shellfish constable will be also testing additionally uh, in order to potentially open up uh, Cohasset waters for recreational shellfish. At the moment, all the waters in, in Cohasset are closed, uh, primarily due to the fact we have not got a bylaw and we don't and we did not have a shellfish constable. But uh, I, I've not heard from Josh that he feels he's inadequately compensated. Okay, any other uh, questions, comments? Okay. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you. The uh, uh, let's uh, let's move on to the uh, captain's walk, and I've asked Mike Sardina uh, to give us uh, a general high-level view of what's going on with the captain's walk. Mike has uh, a, a more in-depth presentation, which we will uh, figure out how to get to uh, not only this committee but to the community at a later date. Uh, but it's about a, an hour's presentation, which we really didn't have uh, for this evening, uh, but we will get to that. Uh, so, uh, Mike, if you can take us through that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Tim. Um, one of the more visible and certainly more exciting townwide uses along the harbor's edge is the projected Captain's Walk project, which is um, to be a physical walk, which is not what exists currently. Captain's Walk historically um, is basically a route. It links um, uh, part of the government island uh, historic pieces all the way around the harbor over to the Oaks on Margin Street. And the um, Captain's Walk, which currently uh, goes around the Harbor Inn, uh, will ultimately go be along the edge of the cove um, through the condominium projects, uh, public open space, uh, right on the water's edge, which is fantastic because it gives us literally um, a shoreline walking access uh, all the way around the harbor with the exception of the oaks and wherever there isn't any uh, 
uh, access in general. So um, what we have is we have uh, analysis of the existing conditions. Um, we have a survey that was um, provided to the town, a topographic survey that was done uh, over the last six months and provided to the town in January. Um, using that survey information, we're able to evaluate opportunities and constraints for the physical um, uh, imagining of the captain's walk uh, over that entire length that I just described. And the information that has uh, been put together is something that we're excited to share with the community um, and uh, solicit uh, input and, uh, and ideas in addition to uh, the um, analysis, which is what we're going to be showing at this uh, dedicated meeting coming up. Thanks, Mike. Any uh, <clears throat> any questions? Any comments? I can say that the the captain's walk, uh, as Mike allude, alluded to, is really one of the jewels in the uh, the crown of Cohasset Harbor. Um, uh, the Cohasset Harbor Committee, from the beginning, uh, whenever we started this process uh, prior to the uh, harbor plan, uh, really envisioned. Uh, better access to the community to the harbor or for the community to the harbor. Um, and uh, the owners of the private properties around the harbor uh, have really been instrumental in, in creating that opportunity. The Cohasset uh, Hospitality Partners uh, have with the uh, Captain's Walk that will go in front of the new building there. Um, and you just heard Eamon Amaro talk about the Captain's Walk that will go uh, through the property where Atlantica is now. Um, and we're still, you know, we're gonna have to work on uh, how we get over to Government Island uh, with the Captain's Walk. Uh, it's a, a bit uh, complicated in that we're also looking at uh, resiliency issues, uh, the seawall uh, uh, on top of which will be the Captain's Walk. We have to address <clears throat> that to make sure uh, we don't want to put a beautiful captain's walk on top of a seawall that then has to be uh, raised, uh, torn apart and, and reconfigured. So it is a complicated issue. Mike's doing a great job. We do have uh, drawings and we will have a public uh, forum to, uh, to look at that as time goes on. Thank you, Mike. Any comments from, uh, from the audience? Uh, okay. Uh, with that, uh, George, would you like to talk a little bit about the Climate Resiliency Summit? Yes, thanks, Tim. Let me uh, share my screen briefly. So I just want to give an update. Uh, Lisa Hewitt, Dick, and I have been, actually, I'm going to stop my video just a moment so I get full screen on here. Yeah. Um, yeah. There we go. Um, Lisa Hewitt, Dick, and I have been co-leading an initiative that we actually, uh, Tim, you helped launch this in our October 21 meeting. We decided we wanted to do a resilience initiative working closely with Lauren Lind and Chris Sr. Um, as a result, we, we've been had a really uh, successful series of initiatives. Uh, if you could see on the screen, we in January 25th, we had a presentation of exploring potential impacts of extreme weather events on Cohasset Harbor, and then followed that in April by looking at what, what would be the impact on town infrastructure and services of the extreme weather event. Again, the, the tact we took on this was to look at hurricanes and nor'easters because they are sort of proxies for uh, uh, climate change in terms of potential sea level rise and what happens when really high sea levels hit Cohasset Harbor, as well as simply the prevalence of extreme storms that we've all experienced and that are being experienced more frequently, you know, around the globe. We do have a our third and at least final for this series forum scheduled for June for June sixth. A view from Beacon Hill, uh, funding opportunities and considerations, and I'll give a little more on that in a minute. Just uh, want to give a brief plug, Lauren Lind and Cassandra have been doing a great job of keeping the Cohasset Harbor Committee page on, on the Cohasset website updated. So 
For anybody who's interested or hasn't seen it, all the presentations are on the website, as well as videos from YouTube and Facebook. Really helpful um, if you're looking uh, for information about these. What I wanted to share though very briefly is what we've learned from this. So in the first forum, we looked at a hypothetical storm that could be a little bit different tack than we've done before. Tom Bell uh, took data that had been uh, come out of the uh, uh, storm tide pathway study that the town funded with Situate in 2019 and 2020 and modeled that of what would happen with a storm surge, not just wave action from a nor'easter, but a storm surge that could happen from a hurricane really coming straight across Bassings Beach or Briggs Harbor. And if that combined with a king tide and potentially heavy rainfall, particularly from a hurricane, we saw the opportunity for, call it a storm of record that hasn't been witnessed or experienced by Cohasset ever. We came close to that in 2018. And frankly, last October and November had the king tide and storm surge from those happened at the same time, we potentially would have experienced a new storm of record as recently as six months ago. The concern that came out of the, the January 25th meeting was the really the flooding of the Elm Meadows and the vulnerability of the sewage treatment plant, police and fire department building in the village. So it wasn't meant to come up with solutions, but it did identify vulnerabilities and risks. In our most recent forum on April 11th, we had speakers from Glenn Pratt from Emergency Preparedness, uh, Bill McGowan and, and Wayne Sawchuck from the Sewer Commission, uh, Brian Joyce from the DPW, and Chief Sylvia and Doc Ray from the Fire Department. And what was really interesting there is yes, what we learned, but also you know what might not have been said, because what we're truly trying to find out is what are the you know what is the resilience of our uh, infrastructure near the harbor. And uh, not surprisingly, you know, there's, there's probably lots of opportunities to improve our resilience. Uh, Glenn went through what emergency preparedness does. A lot of what they do is pre-position assets, but also they're the conduit for state and federal disaster relief funds should a disaster happen. The sewer commission went through the work they're doing to improve, you know, Simple mundane things like manhole covers that if they're not well protected, cause the sewer treatment plant to, to actually get overwhelmed with millions of gallons of, of water that they have to treat uh, in if it gets flooded. So simple things like infiltration and inflow are huge issues for the sewer commission and the sewer treatment plant. There is a lot of risk uh, there. Uh, Brian, uh, Joyce went through the DPW and, you know, the risks from nor'easters, which we identified. And then the fire department, you know, they're awesome. They're primarily going to react, you know, in terms of proactive resilience uh, measures, they're counting on other parts of town government to deal with that. In the case of disaster, they're going to find a way to help people, but they are very concerned in the case of, of storms about access to Atlantic Avenue, Howard Gleason Road, Stockbridge, Margin, all the areas around the harbor that do flood, even at simple king tides, let alone storms of record. And, you know, pointing out that the, the tide cycle is, uh, you know, something they consider. Something that isn't so well known is the concern of national grid. When flooding happens, salt water has the potential and does infiltrate natural gas lines and meters, and is a very dangerous situation. So those are things the fire department is focused on. I think to, you know, just to wrap up this, this summary, which is just an interim summary, looking at what our next steps are, we do have our form number three, would really encourage everybody who's here today to participate in that. It's gonna be a very focused discussion by our representatives at the state level, talking about this, the, the current state of funding of initiatives, and even specifically, you know, what are the uh, concerns and considerations of Cohasset uh, and our in our maybe our neighbors in seeking that funding? You know, a, a wealthy town like Cohasset with the shoreline we do seeking funding. But I think what's what comes up in between now and then is identifying the the vulnerabilities and risks that we want to address 
getting consensus on those, identifying solutions to those issues. And only with those solutions, then are we really in a position to uh, go after funding. The solutions may be hire consulting firms to zero in on the solutions, whatever they may be. This is the draft, it's for more consideration by the Cohasset Harbor Committee and also the town to figure out, you know, how do we proceed to address vulnerabilities which you know we've come very close to experiencing. Um, Lisa, would you like to add anything uh, before I finish up here? Uh, the only thing I would add is my poor editing skills. I did not catch that we spelled Patrick O'Connor's name incorrectly. It's O R. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the other thing I would add is that we have invited and hope to also have um, one of the uh, grants administrators from the Seaport Economic Council who provides guidance and, and review of um, grants for this area to join us. We've spoken to them several times and they're gonna see if they are, um, are able to fit it into this schedule. So that also would be an interesting um, angle to, to hear presented. Thank you, George. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Tim, that's, uh, that's our update. Thank you very much, George, and thank you, Lisa. Uh, uh, just a, a, a couple of uh, notes on that. Uh, uh, the work to do to make Cohasset Harbor and, and therefore uh, the rest of the Cohasset community uh, more resilient to the coming uh, climate change uh, in terms of storm, sea level rise, tidal surge, and so forth uh, is, uh, is large. Uh, and it is very uh, integrated uh, with lots of different moving parts. Uh, I have said in the past several times that I think between public, private, and nonprofit uh, funding, uh, Cohasset Harbor over the next 10 years, we'll see between 50 and 100 million. That may be a low number. Uh, and a lot of that money is has got to come from uh, grant funding that the state and the federal government uh, have just for this. And I uh, I know that uh, I have heard many times that, oh, Cohasset's a wealthy community, therefore they're down on the lower part of the list for, uh, for grant funding. Uh, nevertheless, we have to stay diligent. We have to work uh, with our, uh, our political leaders to make sure that we do get that funding because we, we're gonna need it. We're, we can't do that uh, all with uh, town funds. And that leads me into the next uh, item on the on the agenda, which uh, is for Cassandra to tell us about an exciting grant program. Uh, Coastal Zone Management has put us in touch with uh, grant funding. Uh, and so Cassandra, could you tell us a little bit about that program and what we're trying to accomplish there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I've been working with Lauren Lind, our planning and zoning director, to put in an application for the upcoming CZM, Coastal Zone Management uh, Grant, which is due on June 6th. Uh, we are currently working with Woods Hole Group to create that application. Um, they're going to do some of the wordage for us um, and create the budget outline. Um, the goal is that we're going to be focusing on the James Brook watershed area for flood mapping. Um, I think we're going to be assessing some vulnerabilities, uh, strategizing for wastewater infrastructures and whatnot, um, and then developing and modeling regional coastal inland flood resiliency strategies as well. Um, so it's, it's something that's certainly in progress right now. Um, we have some time to submit it um, and hoping that obviously we will be selected uh, would always be a positive thing. Um, Great, thank you. Thank you, Cassandra. Yes, it's uh, uh, the, the, the one thing that I have learned in my discussions with many uh, people around the, the state and actually outside the state is that uh, once we start the process, if we were successful in getting this uh, grant, um, the state tends to be supportive and will work with us. I think CCM is, is, is that way. 
So if we're successful in getting started, I think that will help uh, broaden that scope as time goes on and we'll have other opportunities to do it. Uh, one of the things we are uh, looking at is the, the biggest barrier we have uh, uh, as a protection to what we call Cohasset Cove and there from there into Cohasset Village down Elm Street or James Brook or wherever uh, is uh, Bassing Beach and the breakwater. Uh, so we are uh, uh, beginning to look at what it's going to take there to improve that. Does the breakwater need to be heightened? Does it need to be moved? Does it need to be changed? Uh, and what, uh, what can be done, what should be done with Bassings Beach to make sure that that uh, stays as a barrier beach, which it is. Now, as we know, that's all privately owned. Uh, uh, Cohasset Conservation Trust owns a big chunk of that property. And then there's a lot of other private uh, individuals and organizations. Friends of Bassey Beach owns part of that. Uh, and uh, we're looking at what needs to be done to make sure that that barrier beach not only remains, but perhaps can even be improved and restored. Uh, over the years, there's been a lot of erosion of the beaches and the salt meadows around by the glades. Uh, and so we need to really take a look at how do we stop that from happening so that it continues to be a barrier. Okay, any, uh, any comments on that presentation? All right, I think we've gotten through the majority of uh, what I had on my agenda. Uh, does any member of the committee have any comment or thoughts or anything else they'd like to bring forward before I open it up to the rest of the audience? Um, I, I have something to add, Susan. Who's this? Susan oh. Bryant. Okay, go ahead, Susan. So our state of the harbor that CSCR runs annually, that's, just, that's our time where we um, present student research on such things as have been mentioned, like Bassings Beach um, is erosion, the salt marshes, the eelgrass beds, uh, water quality, uh, runoff. Um, so we have the students present this research annually and we usually actually um, make the theme of our State of the Harbor Community Stakeholder Forum something that's related to the current events that have happened in the harbor. Um, so I feel like I didn't actually hit the ones that we would have if I had known about um, all these topics before today. Um, but we are focusing on what is meaningful as far to, as a educational experience in the watershed. Um, and we have some great presentations and we always like to have everybody who's involved in caring about the harbor come to these events. So please put this in your calendar, um, May 18th. That's Wednesday at uh, Wilcut Commons, 91 Sawyer Street, Cohasset, 7 p.m. Our target end date is 8 p.m. but we always do like to talk longer than we intend. Um, and we also will have a Zoom link. So um, please participate in this community forum, uh, all of you. And um, I would also just urge that anybody who's putting a grant in to CZM or other, Seaport Development Council or whatever, that it's a great idea to include youth elements of those grants. We have lots of youth that are involved and really excited about doing things about climate change, about coastal resiliency, we have engineering groups, we have students that have been studying GI, ArcGIS and learning to map things, and they're really quite proficient. So um, if you um, would like more information on how to include youth elements in any of these proposals, um, I'd be happy to um, lead you to the students and the programs and help you design something that's really a win for citizen scientists getting community engaged and um, the future of youth in Cohasset. Thank you, Susan. Okay, uh, anybody else on the committee uh, with that? Uh, anybody else who is participating have any questions, comments, thoughts? Well, with that, uh, I thank you all very much for participating. This has been a very full meeting uh, and lots going on in the harbor. Uh, I am happy to uh, address any questions that you may have. I think most of you have my email 
Uh, I cannot do a, uh, if there are more than, I think three people from the Harbor Committee, we can't deliberate. So I can certainly do one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but other than that, we'll uh, make sure you're all aware of our next uh, meeting. I'd like to have another uh, Harbor Committee or a CHIP Committee uh, meeting prior to the beginning of uh, summer when people tend to uh, have other interests that uh, take their time. Uh, but we will try to do that and make sure everybody is aware of that because there is a lot going on. Uh, with that, um, I will ask for a vote uh, to adjourn from the committee meeting, uh, com committee members that are here. If you're- uh, Motion to adjourn, Tim. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor, aye. 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 It sounds like a majority to me. Cassandra, thank you very much for uh, leading this charge. Thank you to the committee and thank you all, particularly to the community who have joined us. I really appreciate your uh, uh, coming to this and welcome any input you may have in the future. With that, uh, good night, stay safe. Uh, I look forward to having a in-person meeting, uh, hopefully in June when we have our climate, next climate summit. Terrific, thank you, Tim. Good night all. Right. Great, thank you.